So, um, well, let's just start then. So, uh, my name is Ricardo Garcia. Uh, I work at Igalia. I'm part of his graphics team, and I mostly work on the CTS uh, project, like creating new Vulkan tests and and fixing, <clears throat> sorry, and fixing existing ones. So sometimes this means I also contribute to the specification text of of Vulkan and other pieces of the Vulkan ecosystem. So um, today I'm going to talk about the the story behind the border color Swizzle extension that was published last year. Uh, because I created uh, tests for, for this extension and I also participated in its release process uh, and I'm listed as one of the uh, uh, contributors for the for the specification text of the extension. So um, um, I've already uh, started mentioning border colors as, as part of the extension name. So um, before we dive directly into the extension, let me give you a brief, ex a brief uh, introduction to sampling operations in Vulkan and explain where border colors fit in that. So sampling, of course, means uh, reading pixels from an image view and is typically done in the fragment shader. For example, when uh, you want to apply a texture to some geometry or something like that. So in the example that you see here, we have an image view with uh, three 8-bit color components. Uh, they are in VGR order and in unsigned uh, normalized form. So this means that we'll suppose that, it, that each uh, image pixel is stored in memory using three bytes, uh, with each byte corresponding to the blue, green, and red components in, in that order. Uh, however, when we read pixels from that, from that image view, we want to get back normalized uh, floating point values between zero for the lowest value and one for the highest value, that is when, when all bits are one and the natural number in memory is 255. So as you can see um, in the GLSL code, the result of the operation is a vector of, of four floating point numbers. So since the image does not have uh, alpha information, it's natural to think that uh, the output vector may have a one in the last component making the color opaque. Uh, and if the coordinates of the sample operation make us uh, read the pixel that I have represented here in the slides as an example, we would get the values that you see on the right. Um, so it's also worth noting that the sampler argument that you can, you, you, we are passing to the texture function called in the LSL is a combination, is actually a combination of two objects in Vulkan. So you have an image view and you have a sampler object that specifies how sampling is is done. So, <clears throat> uh, focusing a bit on the on the coordinates uh, used to sample from the image, the most common case is using normalized coordinates, uh, which means using floating point values between zero and one in each of the image axes. Uh, for example, in the two D case we have here uh, on on the right. Um, but what happens if the if the coordinates fall outside that range? So they are not between zero and one. That that means uh, that we would be sampling outside the original image in points around it, like the the red marks you see on the right, the red axis that, that I put there. Uh, and what happens depends on how the sampler is configured. So when you create the sampler, you can specify a so-called addressing mode. Uh, that is independent for each of the three texture coordinate axes that may be used. In, in, a, in our example, because it's a 2D image, we would only be using two of those. Um, and there are several possible uh, address modes that you can use. So the most common one is probably the one you can see on the bottom left, which is the repeat addressing mode, which applies some kind of module operation to the coordinates as, as if the texture was virtually repeating in the selected axis. Uh, there's also the clamp mode on the top right, for example, which clamps coordinates to zero and one and produces the, the, this effect of the texture borders extending beyond the, the image edge. And the case we are interested in is the one on the top left, which is the, the border uh, mode. Uh, when sampling outside the original image, we get what, what we call a border color, as if the image was surrounded by a virtually infinite frame of, uh, of a chosen color. Um, then uh, <clears throat> the border color is specified when creating the sampler. 
So uh, initially, uh, you can only uh, choose one among a restricted set of, of values. So you get transparent black, which is all zeros, you get opaque white, which is all ones, or you get a, uh, the special opaque black color, which has a zero in all uh, color components and a one in the alpha component. So I'm, I say it's a special because no, not every uh, component is the same. So then we get the custom border color extension. Uh, the custom border color extension introduced the possibility of specifying uh, arbitrary RGBA colors when creating the sampler. Um, however, um, sampling operations are also affected by one parameter that's not part of the sampler object. Uh, it's part of the image view and it's called the component swizzle. So in the example I gave you before, uh, we got some color values back but that was supposing that the component swizzle was the identity swizzle. The identity swizzle means that no uh, color components were reordered or replaced uh, uh, or, or, or any operation was done with them. However, uh, it's possible to specify other swizzles, uh, like indicating what the uh, resulting final color should be for each of the four components. And you can do some operations with that. You can, for example, you can reorder the components arbitrarily for example, saying that the red component uh, should actually come from the original blue one. Uh, you can force some of them to be zero or one. You can also replicate one of the original components in multiple positions of the final color, et cetera. So it's, it's a flexible mechanism uh, and, and you can indicate what you want to get in each of the, of the uh, output components. Um, so while working on the sync uh, method driver, uh, Mike, discovered that the interaction between non-identity swizzle and, and custom border colors produced different results for different implementations. And he was wondering if the result was specified at all in, in, in Vulkan. And um, let me give you an example. Uh, so for example, you, you specify a custom border color of uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, which is opaque blue and an addressing mode of uh, clamping to border in, in the sampler. So the image view has this strange swizzle that you can see here that I used, an, that I used as an example, um, where uh, the, the um, red component should come from the original blue, the green component is always zero, the blue component comes from the original uh, green, and the alpha component is not modified. So if the swizzle applies to the border color, you get red, and if it does not, you get blue. Uh, and any option is more or less reasonable. So, uh, for example, if because if, if the border color is specified as part of the of the sampler, um, maybe you want to get that color back, no matter which image view you use that sampler on. Uh, and, and you are expecting to always get a blue border, which is what you specified when creating the sampler. But another interpretation, which is uh, valid as well, and is also reasonable, is that uh, the border color is supposed to, maybe it is supposed to act as if it came from the original image. And then it should be affected by the swizzle because the normal pixels, the, no, the normal pixels from the image view are affected. And you, you will get red in, in that case, if you suppose that the border color actually is part of the image somehow. Uh, so Jason pointed out uh, that the specification uh, laid out the rules in a section called uh, textual input operations. Uh, this section specifies that swizzling should affect border colors and non-identity swizzles could be applied to custom border colors uh, without restrictions according to the specification. Uh, Contrary to opaque black, which uh, was considered special, and, and non-identity swizzles um, would result in, in undefined values with that border color. Um, so <clears throat> the textile input operations that Jason was talking about, uh, it's, it's a section of the specification that describes what the expected uh, result is according to some steps, which are supposed to happen in a defined order. So it doesn't mean that the hardware has to work exactly like that. So uh, it, you may need uh, instructions before or after the 
uh, sampling operation happens in hardware to uh, correct results or simulate the things happen in the order that you can see here. But um, I'm, I've simplified and removed some of these steps, but if the uh, border color needs to be applied, what we are looking for, well, the, the steps we were interested in is the ones you can see in bold and the step number five in, in, in this list, which is the border color being applied, uh, comes before step number seven, which is the image view swizzle being applied. Um, I'm going to describe the steps a bit in more detail now. So step one is coordinate conversion. Uh, this includes uh, converting normalized coordinates to integer uh, texel coordinates uh, for the image view and, and clamping and modifying those values depending on the addressing mode that we specified before. So once that is done, step two is validating the coordinates. And here's where you decide if texel replacement takes place or not. And that texel replacement will use the border color in some cases. And in other sampling modes, um, for example, you also get to decide if robustness features need to be applied and taken into account when, when, when doing this. Then we get to step three. Step three happens when the coordinates are valid and is reading the actual texel from the image. Uh, this immediately implies reordering components from the in-memory layout to the standard RGBA layout, which means a BGR image view gets its components immediately put in RGB order after reading, immediately after reading. And, and you never actually see the BGR order anywhere other than specifying that when creating the view and, 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 all, and all that. But from the, um, from the shader point of view, you never see BGR. So um, step four uh, also applies if an actual texel was read from the image and is uh, format conversion. So for example, uh, unsigned normalized formats need to convert uh, pixel values. So which are stored as natural numbers in memory to floating point values. So uh, our example texel that you can see here in the slides is which I've already uh, put in RGB order following the previous step that will result in the values you can see on the right. Um, then step five is the critical one for border is texel replacement and is, is the alternative to the previous two steps when the coordinates were not valid. Uh, so in the case of border colors, uh, this means taking the border color and uh, cutting it short. So it only has the components present in the original image view because we are trying to make it look like the uh, actual border color came from the original image as if it was part of it. So uh, because this happens after the color components have already been reordered, the border color is always specified in the standard red, green, blue, and alpha order when creating the sampler. Uh, and the fact that the original image view was in BGR order is irrelevant for, for the border color. So we care uh, about the alpha component being missing, but not about the in-memory order of the image view. And then um, in the example below, we specified an, an original border color of a, some kind of a transparent blue. And then uh, in this step, it is converted to just blue without alpha component information. Um, step six, uh, takes us back to a unified flow of, of steps. It applies to the color uh, no matter where it came from. So the color is then expanded to always have four components as you expect in, in the shader. So the missing color components are replaced with zeros and the alpha component, if it is missing, is set to one. In this step, our original transparent blue border is now opaque blue. And we, we lost the alpha component information along the way. Um, step seven, finally, the swizzle is applied. Let's suppose our image view had this, this strange swizzle that I wrote down there in, in, in the slide in which the red component uh, comes from the original blue, the green component is set to zero, the blue one is set to one, and the alpha component is not modified, identity uh, swizzle. So our original transparent blue border has now become opaque magenta. And that's how it works. Um, so we have this situation uh, in which some implementations swizzled the border color 
and others did not. So what could we do? Uh, there are several strategies we could follow here. Uh, we could double down on the existing specification text and ask vendors uh, to fix their implementations. But what happens if they cannot fix them or, or if the fix is impractical uh, due to its impact in, in performance, for example? And unfortunately, that was the actual situation because some implementations could not be fixed. Uh, and after discovering this problem, CTS tests were going to be created for these cases. And if an implementation failed to behave as, as mandated by the spec, it wouldn't pass conformance. So those implementations only had one way out, which is uh, to stop supporting custom border colors. Uh, but that's also uh, a bit of a loss for users because uh, then those implementations, if they were in widespread use, then users could no longer use uh, custom border colors. And, and, and some of those implementations were in widespread use for, for the use cases for which this was uh, created. Uh, so the second option is backpedaling a bit and making behavior that was uh, previously defined. Well, now it's undefined unless some other feature is present and, and, and we could design perhaps a, a mechanism that would allow uh, custom border colors to be used with non-identity swizzles, at least in some of those implementations, in some of the implementations. Um, and that's basically how the border color swizzle extension was created last year. So custom colors with uh, non-identity swizzle uh, produced undefined results unless the border color swizzle feature uh, is available and enabled. Um, some implementations um, can advertise support for this almost for free, air quotes, not exactly, but, but almost for free. And others uh, could advertise the lack of support for this feature. And in the middle ground, we have some implementations that can indicate that they support the this case but the component swizzle has to be indicated when creating the sampler as well as the image view. So it's both, it's the, the component swizzle is both part of the image view and part of the sampler. And samplers created, created this way can only be used with image views uh, that have a matching component swizzle, which means that those samplers are no longer generic samplers. They, they can only be used with, with some image views. And obviously, um, the drawback of, of this extension, apart from the obvious observation that it should have been, should have been part of the original uh, custom border color extension, is that uh, I would say it somehow lowers the, the bar for applications that want to use uh, a single code path for every vendor. It's, it's um, you know, because if border color swizzle is supported, it's always legal to pass the swizzle when creating the sampler. Uh, some implementations will need it, will need it, and, and 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 the rest can ignore it. So the unified code path that you get now is harder or more specific. Or you have effectively effectively um, uh, forcing uh, uh, um, applications to always pass this uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, a structure when extra structure when when creating the sampler. Uh, so it's now a bit harder to write applications that use uh, custom border colors with uh, non-identity swizzles. And, and that's basically it. Uh, so sometimes the, the Vulcan Working Group in Kronos has had to backpedal and mark as, as undefined something that was, in, in, that was defined in, in previous versions of the Vulcan specification. But it is not that frequent nor, nor ideal, uh, but it, it happens. But it usually does not go as far as, as having to publish a new extension as part of the fix, which is why I consider this interesting and because it, the problem was, was detected was while developing uh, uh, drivers in MISA. Um, and, and that's it. Uh, thanks for, for watching the talk and, and, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks a lot for your talk, Ricardo, and congratulations for managing to give this presentation on the spot, uh, especially since you wrote it two weeks ago and <laughs> sick when this happened. So yeah, congratulations. <laughs> um, so we Thank got you. 
two questions. Um, so the first question uh, is from Ancurio, and he's asking, is Swizzling implemented in hardware? I think for, for well, any any question that, that, that um, uh, and what I have to talk about implementations, uh, is an, uh, take it with a grain of salt because I don't work on implementations. But as far as I understand, yes, uh, on some implementations, the swizzling of the image view is supplied in hardware. So you can specify that as part of the offline instruction and you can get the swizzling back uh, correctly. Sometimes you have to do that in the shaders. So if, if, the, if the image view, if its implementation detects that the image view uh, has this, uh, this whistle, it would have to emit uh, ex uh, extra instructions. But the normal thing, the normal thing of, as far as I know is that the hardware does the whistling normally. Okay, very good. And he had another question. Um, he was wondering if when you said lowering the bar for applications, um, you are, if you actually meant raising the bar or maybe... right, Yeah, probably. <laughs> Sorry if I didn't uh, express that clearly. So yeah, basically it means that, that you the, the default path is now more complicated. So, I mean, if, if your application requires um, uh, custom border colors and non-identity whistles, you need the feature. And if you're going to, to code that in the application, you will discover that probably maybe some of your users or, or a significant part of your users have implementations in which need uh, this extra information passed when creating the sampler. So you're probably not going to get rid of, of um, creating a code path in your application that uses that. And if you are creating that code path, it's very tempting to say, okay, that's going to be the only code path and the only one I'm going to use. So yes, using using uh, border colors with non-identity whistles is now effectively harder than it was before. So right. yes, that may be saying raising the bar, yes, instead of lowering the bar. <laughs> so Enunes is asking, was this originally motivated by some real application bug or by something like conformance test spec disambiguation? Uh, I think um, it was part of this well, was it has those those two two inputs because uh, obviously uh, it when when uh, the issue was discovered by by Mike he was uh, using that to write sync so it has some real world implications uh, so it, it was a bug that he he hit while developing sync so it is motivated to you know Resolving this problem is motivated by a real-world application. If Mike hadn't been working on Sync and hadn't hit this bug, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have gotten any correction. And then once that is detected, then yes, the working group has a motivation to make it work uh, properly because um, once the cat is the cat is out of the bag, so to speak, and, and everybody knows that different implementations will produce different things. They want to tie that up and say, okay, that's that's not acceptable. That you get that when sampling, you get very different colors depending on the implementation. So you, we could say uh, maybe it is undefined. Uh, but if the original specification also mentioned that it was supposed to be defined, then we want to add a mechanism that makes it defined again even in under some circumstances. So people who were maybe relying on, on that behavior, uh, they want a solution and it is our duty to provide them with a solution. So yes, uh, then spec disambiguation and conformance tests were used uh, in that second part, but I think it had both, both uh, components. Okay, uh, I think that's that was the last question, but I have one for you. Um, I would like to know what, how was overall your experience with uh, dealing with Kronos on this um, and coordinating between the different vendors? Um, so, because you were giving two examples, like the, um, the case A and B, and um, and I was wondering how these discussions were going and what, how basically you figured out uh, what was the acceptable solution for everyone. No, actually, that that is. Um... The, the main driver uh, for this extension uh, was actually Pierre Zaniel from NVIDIA inside Kronos. And I say, um, I, I would say that um, 
the, the uh, working group in, in uh, for Vulcan in Kronos, uh, it works really well. So, um, I mean, uh, it's uh, they, they work together when, when they have to provide solution. They discuss a lot and, and they do things the right way. So I was only there to to explore. I I, I did the tests initially to try to see if there was uh, 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 different vendors with different uh, behaviors and implementations and what was the right way, the different possibilities that should be provided by the uh, final uh, extension. Like, do we need, for example, to provide the uh, Swizzle when creating the sampler or do we need more information? Maybe someone else needs more or less. And and we I created those tests to pull results between vendors and then vendors um, run the tests and coordinate it and, and, and everything was done pretty well. I think the Kronos group internally, it works uh, pretty well. So so um, I think my experience was very positive. Uh, there's a lot of people dedicated to to making sure uh, that the Vulcan spec is, is good, is consistent, doesn't have those problems and, and they really want to solve the, the problems for application writers. So uh, I just put my grain of salt in there. Can you give an idea about the timeline? Uh, it depends on how complex the problem is. In this yes, case, sir. it was oh. just a few months. Just a oh. few months. Um, um, you, you know, it's it's a slow because the the, the meetings uh, they, they only meet, they don't meet every day. Obviously, there's some things in backlog, and and you need to work on that. But yeah, the problem is detected, and in, someone talks about it. Then the tests are created, the tests are created, and the vendors test, and they discuss, and someone proposes a specification text, then that specification text is reviewed, tests are adapted, whatever. So yeah, it takes weeks, weeks, weeks. So you end up with a few months. Which is bad, but not bad at all. <laughs> not bad, not bad. I think I think it works reasonably well. Yeah, especially in a situation where indeed you would, you need to realize that you broke something or the specification yeah. is not good. So yeah, I yeah. think it's, it's definitely decent. Okay, so I uh, don't think there are any other questions. Uh, I'm sorry again for my camera cropping out. The camera is working. It's just GC that decided to drop it. <laughs> and uh, Which also happened right before the talk started, right? No, no. In this case, it was the um, Firefox that didn't want to uh, open my camera. I can see. Right. <laughs> Always something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the FOSDEM issue is a known issue. We went through that. Uh, first off, Ricardo, thank you for the amazing recovery. <laughs> no problem. That was well done. Um, I said in the FOSDEM video channel on IRC that actually this video is better than the one you recorded because you're not coughing all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well done. Um, this is the second best recovery um, for the uh, FOSDEM graphics dev room. First <laughs> is... Uh, Connor Abbott in 2014, he was then 17 years old. <laughs> we had a half an hour talk slot and we spent 20 minutes of it trying to get his laptop to talk to the projector. <laughs> so we had 10 minutes to ramble off the whole talk. So yours is number two so far in, <laughs> I think, since 2006 is the first dev room we had. So in 16 years with a few hiatus, the second best recovery ever. Well done. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And thank you for organizing. Well, thanks to the FOSM organizers. The FOSM organizers all players. the work this year, especially this year, more than usual. So. And and so. thank you also for, for organizing the graphics dev room, which was missing last year, and it's very nice to have it back this year. Yeah, so, so last year I thought, I thought an hiatus would be good because we do that from time to time when there's not that many talks coming up. We do a hiatus from time to time. But two years running, we definitely should have. So second year without a dev room would have been bad. So we did it. And thank okay. you for talking. So and thanks everybody for listening and for working with us on getting this fixed again. So thank see you. you guys next year. And thanks, Ricardo. And I will see you next year in real life in Brussels. Hope so. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.